Good afternoon. Welcome to the second edition of the Room College and Nurse Practice Google Hangout. And we'd like to welcome everyone today. Um, we have a great panel, some great discussion. And I'm Kevin Lyons. I'm the Executive Director of Rheumatology Nurses Society. And we are so pleased to have you join us today. Um, at the end of this broadcast, we'll also give you information on how to watch the replay of the broadcast, how to actually sign up for the Rheumatology Nurse Practice newsletter, which is a free newsletter that we provide, and some additional information about the RNS Annual Conference and other pieces. Hopefully, you've recently received in the mail the freshest copy of the Rheumatology Nurse Practice newsletter, um, some fantastic things in there going into the fundamentals of biologics, understanding them. Um, we've been getting great feedback, so thank you for your feedback on that. Today on our panel, I would like to introduce three amazing nurses. First off is Iris Zink. She's a MSNNP. She is our president-elect of Rheumatology Nurses Society, and she is a nurse practitioner at the Beals Institute in Lansing, Michigan. We also will have joining us Linda grinnell Merritt. She is a NP, um, BA, or NPBC, excuse me, I'll get my credentials right soon, and she is a nurse practitioner from the University of Rochester Medical Center out of Rochester, New York. Linda is our um, chapter committee chair on the RNS Board of Directors. And finally, we have Miss Elizabeth Kirchner, Betsy Kirchner. She's a CNP from the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, Betsy is our education and curriculum chair. And we'll be talking today about the young adult patient and the transition related to the young adult patient in rheumatology, specifically to RA. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Iris Zink and welcome you to the broadcast. Welcome, everyone. We've got some ways on the screen to ask questions in case you do want to type in a question or tweet a question or call in a question. We're going to get started with talking about rheumatology and this RNP newsletter is amazing so if you get an opportunity to read it it simplifies the immune system so that you can use it as a teaching tool in your office for other nurses and other staff and it really puts it into a language that everyone can understand so it breaks down the immune system and really uses a lot of very good illustrations on how the immune system is affected by rheumatoid arthritis and how you can better convey that to your patients at a level that they can understand simply simplified, simplicity, you know one of those words, <laughs> so they can understand it simply so you can convey the information. We're going to talk today about biomarkers mostly and Betsy does a really great job of explaining that better than I do so I'm going to turn it over to Betsy to explain what is a biomarker and what do they do. Thanks Iris. Hi everyone. So just by way of a little introduction and why I'm interested in biomarkers, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I am interested in biomarkers because I came to rheumatology in a roundabout way. I started out working with an immunologist in his HIV clinic. Um, it wasn't until three or four years later that I started working on the rheumatology side of the clinic. And I was pretty baffled when I started working there um, how to assess the patient's disease activity um, because in HIV we have viral load and CD4 counts. They are two biomarkers, they're blood tests. And they absolutely tell you a patient's current condition, prognosis, and the efficacy of their treatment. So if their viral load is non-detectable, then their medicine's working, period. End of story. Great biomarker. You're done. Um, but what we have in rheumatology is, uh, it will appeal a little bit in comparison, um, probably because RA is a much more heterogeneous, uh, heterogeneous disease than HIV. Um, and there isn't a, a simple biomarker like the viral load. We don't have one number that tells us if a patient's meds are stopping progression of the disease. We can't predict for patients if their disease is going to be aggressive or not beyond a certain scope, and we certainly can't choose meds to use based on lab tests yet. So we'll talk just a little bit about biomarkers in RA. Um, so we do have many biomarkers at our disposal in rheumatology. They're just not quite as easy or clear-cut as the viral load I was talking about in HIV. Um, just because we don't have the holy grail of biomarkers doesn't mean that what we have isn't useful. So the most obvious biomarker we have is the joint exam. You might not think of it as a biomarker, but it is. It can often tell us pretty quickly if a patient's disease is uncontrolled. Uh, we also have the SED rate and CRP, which are used all the time in clinical practice. And patients whose disease correlates to these lab values, they can be very useful. A patient whose SED rate always goes up when they flare, Great, you just keep an eye on their SED rate, you're going to know when their disease is becoming active. 
the caveats with those biomarkers, um, the sub-rate and CRP, is that they're completely normal in up to 50% of patients with RA who have active disease. So in half of our patients, unfortunately, the sub-rate and CRP are not clinically useful to predict flares or um, disease activity. Uh, another widely used set of biomarkers are the antibodies that help us with diagnosis and to some extent with prognosis. Um, about 70 to 80 percent of RA patients will be what we call seropositive. That is, they'll be positive for either rheumatoid factor or anti-CCP or both. And you may already be aware the patients who are strongly anti-CCP positive um, tend to have a worse prognosis. So that is a helpful biomarker to have there. Um, imaging is another set of biomarkers. And it gives us insight into um, the status of a patient's disease, so it qualifies. Um, like most, most biomarkers, it needs to be interpreted with caution, though. Just because you see erosions on a plea film doesn't mean you're looking at active disease. Those erosions could be 20 years old. Um, but if you're looking at plain films in a serial manner, um, you know, over a time span, every six months or two years or whatever the clinic does, uh, it can be helpful. It allows us to literally see inside and see what's going on in the patient's body. MRI and ultrasound are better than x-rays at distinguishing current inflammation from old damage. Um, so that's another subset of the imaging biomarkers. Um, finally, the multi-biomarker disease activity test is the newest biomarker to come to rheumatology. Um, some of you may know it as the Vector test. It's a blood test that looks at 12 different proteins to come up with a composite score that tells us if, if an adult patient is uh, only food for adults so far, if their RA is active, and also if they have high risk for erosions or not. So we do have lots of biomarkers, I didn't even name all of them, those are just sort of the most common, um, that are available to us in rheumatology and more are being researched all the time. So going on to the utility of biomarkers, um, the best biomarkers are those that can provide useful current accurate information and about a specific patient population. At the moment, early diagnosis of RA is a very hot topic in rheumatology. There are a lot of um, abstracts on it at ULR, which Iris will hopefully tell us about at some point. Um, just a few years ago, a patient who was diagnosed within the previous 24 months, so two years, was considered to have early RA. Now that window is narrowed in some cases to 16 weeks. What that means is some researchers believe we only have four months to diagnose a patient correctly with RA and get their disease into complete remission before irreversible damage starts to occur, either directly to the joints or um, to other tissues. So some research indicates if we don't get the disease into remission in those 16 weeks, we never truly will get it 100% controlled. Um, but do we have biomarkers that let us do that? Sort of, sometimes. If a patient comes with classic symptoms, you know, um, uh, symmetric joint swelling and pain, and then the, you find you pull a rheumatoid factor and a CCP, and one or both are positive, then it is very possible to diagnose somebody you know, within that window and start them on treatment. Um, but a lot of patients, as you all know, have a less classic presentation. So they have migratory joint pain or unilateral joint pain. Um, they may not develop antibodies for years. So you, you test them and they come up negative, but you test them a few years later and they're positive. And so you've already, you're, you're way out of your 16-week window at that point. And in that time period, they're probably diagnosed with something like undifferentiated arthritis or um, inflammatory arthritis, maybe Sjogren's disease, or maybe even fibro. So if a patient has a positive anti-CCP, it can be a great biomarker for early disease, but it's a big if. Uh, a new test that I think was on the previous screen, but it's okay, I called the 1433-ADA. Uh, has been in the press recently because it increases the sensitivity of early diagnosis. So, you know, obviously people are sort of working towards this specific biomarker. It's about the same. If you do a CCP and an RF, you get about the same um, sensitivity as if you use the 1433 ADA. But um, what it has, what it does better is if, um, if you add them all together, you do capture more patients with early disease. Um, it also correlates with erosive disease, much the same way as a strongly positive anti-CCP does. So we need to keep an eye on that biomarker, and hopefully it will pan out to be a useful tool. Um, my dream biomarker, and I'm sure everybody did, is one that will tell us which medications will work best, so treatment efficacy. Uh, we waste an enormous 
amount of money and patient time and our time using trial and error to find out which medicines are going to work on our patients. We try one, it doesn't work. We try another, it doesn't work. We try them together, maybe it works better. It's a big waste. So there are some biomarkers out there to help guide us in choosing therapy. Um, they've been developed in the research setting, and they really haven't been proven to be useful in the real world setting yet. Either the assays are difficult, not every lab can do them, or they're too expensive to do, or you can't replicate the results outside of the research setting. Um, but we continue to hope for the tests that will tell us. You know, for example, first of all, we detected your RA very early, and second of all, based on this blood test, we know that, for example, uh, combination DMARDs will work best for you, or an anti-TNF will work best for you, and we can just go straight to treating them with the best uh, possible medication. Hey, Betsy, how often yeah. do you do the 14E33 in your practice? Do you do it every six months, or do you do it once and then, then done, or...? The 1433 ADA, we don't use it all in our practice. It's for it um, was just published in the last few months um, by some Canadian researchers, and we were fortunate to have them come down and talk to us at work um, about their about their research. And um, it is available as a send out test. It's commercially available, but it's still a send out. And like I said, it's mostly for early diagnosis. So um, it's for the patient that comes in your practice new, and you're trying to figure out if they do in fact have RA. Um, Linda, I, have you used it in New York at all? No, we haven't used any of the new biomarkers. We're kind of we're looking at it, but nobody's jumping in on it yet. Okay, good. Hey Betsy, real quick, we have a question from Twitter from uh, Mary. Why four months, and what is the magic number? Why four months is um. Well, uh, Iris, did you see any of the the abstracts that you are? Some of them, yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, why four months is just what they, they found. They, they did retrospective studies. They looked back and they said if these patients were, were diagnosed within four months of their very first symptom um, and treated and they went into remission, um, some, there was one that used the Vectra and others that used more traditional biomarkers. Um, anyway, if they went into remission within four months, um, they, they did much better over years. I think it might have been... Um, some of the large databases like Rabbit out of Germany that, that they, you know, they have years and years of data on these patients. And so they sort of went backwards until they got to, well, less than four months isn't any better than four months, so four months is sort of... And that connects can. back to the European data where once their patients have been on a biologic, a lot of times they're able to stop biologics because they're able to get them fully in remission. Whereas in America when we're slower to the giddy up to get them diagnosed and treated. It's harder for us to sustain remission in America than it is in Europe. So, exactly, it explains a lot of why their stopping trials do better than our stopping trials. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's move on to the case study, Linda. Can you describe that for us, please? Yeah. So this is our patient, RB. She's a 20-year-old Caucasian female. She's transitioning from our pediatric practice. I am fortunate to work in a university where we do have pediatric and adult room. Um, she has been treated there since the age of 10. Uh, she was initially referred to the adult, um, adult room uh, clinic about two years ago, but she never showed up for her appointments. Um, she was away at college, and you know, I kind of feel some of this is our fault too because. We probably didn't try hard enough to get her in to see us. But anyway, that's more discussion later. Uh, she was previ previously treated with numerous medications. Most recent recently, she was on Etanercept, although she said she's not taken any medications in the last couple of years. Um, she reports recently that she's had increased morning stiffness, fatigue, and numerous tender and swollen joints, as can be expected. And she's feeling kind of depressed, you know, the worsening symptom, she's not able to keep up with her friends. So this is impacting her life at this point, which I'm sure is why that brings her into us. So additional patient history. Her past medical history was significant for attention deficit disorder. She's had joint and leg pain. She's had bony changes in her thumbs. And she had a fractured clavicle at the age of nine. I believe this is a girl who used to ride horses quite a bit. Um, she's had multiple surgeries over the years to correct um, some deformities in her hands. Again, the most recent medication um, that she remembers taking is Antanercept, and she says it's been a couple of years. And she's not certain about what insurance coverage she has. She believes she's still covered under her parents' insurance, so that's something we'll have to look into a little bit more. 
Her social history, she's just returning home for the summer and she's living with her parents. She plans on working part-time during the summer. She's currently not seeing anyone and she denies being sexually active. She's not on birth control. She denies regular alcohol or drug use and reports poor sleep due to school pressures and activities. On physical exam, she's a well-appearing young lady. Um, she not in any acute distress. Uh, she has no rashes, no ray nods, or mucous membranes were moist. Um, neck was supple, trachea was midline. She had no adenopathy. Her lungs were clear. She was breathing very comfortably. Same with her heart rate. There were no murmurs. It was rate, rate was regular. But our musculoskeletal exam was, you know, we'll go to another slide. I'll show that in a second. But she had multiple swollen and tender joints. She was she appeared pretty uncomfortable, and she had some chronic changes of long-standing inflammatory arthritis. Her gait was slightly impaired, and she had this severe microacnea, which I have a hard time pronouncing, just where her jawline is much smaller, which is seen frequently with people who have JIA. Um, she reports her pain on a scale of 8 out of 1 to 10, with 10 being the most severe pain. Um, daily morning stiffness is lasting several hours. Uh, she has not had any recent infections or fevers, and in the past has done, had no problems tolerating her medications. So this is, um, I love these little show and tells. This is a kind of quick and easy. I put these in all my charts. And I like to think that it helps when we're going for prior auth so they don't have to dig through uh, everything we write, but they can kind of look at the pictures. But what we see here, she has nine tender joints and seven swollen joints, and mostly affected are her elbows, her wrists, and a few of the MCPs. Next. <laughs> and her labs. She had a sed rate of 85, the CRP was 23, her white count was 10.9, hemoglobin is 10.5, her crits 36, AST of 32, and ALT of 36, and normal renal function at 0 0.9. We did obtain x-rays of her hands and feet, and these demonstrated multiple erosive changes and deformities that are consistent with inflammatory arthritis. And here we get to to plug all this information into our DAS or disease activity score, we do use the DAS 28. And again, this is something we're able to, from our uh, electronic medical record, we can put this right in the notes, um, which is great for when our charts are being audited, great for um, when you're looking for prior auths. Again, so it's a quick thing that they can look at. But we see she had nine tender joints. She had seven swollen joints. Her CRP was 23. Her sed rate's 85. Uh, patient pain level was 8, and her global disease activity that she reported was 6. Again, that's on a score of 1 to 10. So what you can see here, her DAS-20H shows high disease activity of greater than 5.1. Um, so we got to get this girl fixed. And again, I, I really love these. I don't know if anybody else is utilizing these in their charts, but we love putting these into our notes. And in further review of the electronic medical record, um, again, I'm fortunate she's been filed through the same um, clinic, you know, through the same hospital university uh, since she was diagnosed. So when looking back, I see that she's diagnosed as seropositive, uh, destructive JIA with a rheumatoid factor at the time of diagnosis of 46. She's current with all her vaccinations. Her PPD does need to be updated this year. Um, there's no documentation that she's had any OB or GYN exams. And what I can see is that her parents have been very involved in her care until she went away to school. And then what we see is that there are fewer reported visits or phone calls. Mm -hmm. So um, these are just a few key takeaway points before we go into discussion a little bit. I found this recently. Um, so there's a lot going on out there, I think, about transitioning these young adults into the adult programs. And there was an article recently written that came out of Canada. And um, I kind of thought it was helpful, and it helps me to think about this when I go in and see these uh, young adults. So uh, transition means a purposeful, planned movement of adolescents and young uh, adults from the chronic physical medical with chronic physical medical conditions from child-centered to adult-oriented healthcare systems, which is really a big change for them. Um, these young adults are typically transferred between the ages of 16 to 22, which is often a very vulnerable time. They are typically preoccupied with peer and sexual relationships, recreational school activities, and may engage in high-risk behaviors. So I always kind of think that helps when I go in to see these kids. I kind of have that in the back of my mind, so I found that to be helpful. 
And then let's go and look at some discussion points here. Here we are. Well, the first question I think is easy. Um, you, you know, what's the most important thing we need to do for this young girl is we've got to get her treated. So we're going to have to break down the barriers, uh, you know, make certain we know what insurance coverage she has, and then see what we need to do to get her treated, whether we're getting her back on her former medication, um, her antaricep, or um, if we're going to need to look at something else. I guess that's where my biomarkers would be helpful. Um, and then, but more importantly, I'm going to need to do something for her in the immediate immediately because we know that's not going to work for her right away. So I think that's kind of typical of what we'd all be doing. Pipe in if you guys have any other suggestions or ideas. Um, but I think that moving forward is, is this transition. You know, I'm fortunate I do work in an area where there's pediatric and adult. I also happen to work with a, uh, a rheumatologist who's half her time is pediatrics and half her time is adult health. Um, so she actually, uh, we have developed a little way of doing this where we are actually, um, we have a meet and greet. So as they're getting ready to transition, they get to come in and meet me. And then I, if they're, especially if they have any kind of infusions, I then walk them through the infusion room. I introduce them to some of the nurses because they've been in a very protective setting for a very long time. Uh, adult rheumatology and, and adult chronic care. You know, they have their social workers and their nurses and their RNs and their temp you know, generally the same people they've seen for a very, very long time, and now we're sending them into this adult world. And mom and dad are usually always with them at some of these, but now what we find is sometimes the kids are coming, young adults are coming by themselves, um, or, um, you know, are, are a little angry and they don't want mom and dad speaking for them. So it's kind of a way of starting to integrate them into our um, adult world. So we found that to be helpful. I also am going to plug in for our um, RNS chapters. I was having a talk with one of the pediatric nurse practitioners at a recent chapter meeting, and they are saying that they are working harder and harder on their part, or trying to start talking to the kids, you know, these young adults, adolescents, and um, young adults before they start transitioning, trying to make certain they know their medications. And, you know, mom and dad step up that they say something. Okay, how would you approach that with a young woman and say birth control or alcohol use? Yeah, so mom and dad were not present, so that actually was easy. Uh, with other children that we've had come in, we will ask mom and dad sometimes to step out because I think it's difficult um, when mom and dad are there. I'm not always certain I'm going to get the true answer. Uh, and then so even offering it to them, you know, mom and dad might be like, oh, no, you know, I, they don't need birth control. So. We'll either ask mom and dad to step out. We usually kind of do it under the, you know, we want to examine them and give them a gown and stuff, where we have an opportunity to just kind of speak um, with the child a little bit more privately. And that seems to work well. Um, she was still adamant that she wasn't sexually active. Um, I think she still has some body issue, issues, you know, so I, I kind of believed her on that. Um, but... Yeah, it's um, it can be touchy because you have sometimes you have these parents that come in and they're not ready to relinquish and they won't let these young kids, you know, adults speak for themselves. Um, and then yeah, you know, or you have the other parents who are just more than happy to sit in the waiting room and not be involved. And the kids sit there and like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know what insurance I have, I don't know. Um, but then we like to start steering the discussion as to, okay, you're going to be going back to school and what are your plans? Where are your medications going to get sent to? And I think sometimes those are things that kind of get missed if bigger pictures getting through graduation and get accepted into college, if that's the route they're going. Um, but where are these drugs being delivered to? Is it del delivered to a dorm room? Who's there to accept these medications, especially these that have to be refrigerated? Do you have a refrigerator in your room? So it, you can't just do it at the one visit. It is definitely a build up and working with them. And, you know, I think when they're in the pediatric section is still room. There's more support services, but frequently it's the provider, and we have to kind of put that all in there. So I don't know if you've had the same opportunities to work with these young, um, young, young adults coming into your practices. Yes, yes. There's a, There's a question here about the, 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 the gas. gas. So, so best 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 can use the gas in your in your at all. Can Kevin maybe repeat the question because I got a big echo. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can you try that again, Nars? 
the deaths. I, I'm just wondering. Oh, I'm I don't think many clinics use it. My clinic certainly does it. We use a lot of the Vectra as a biomarker, but I'm wondering if Cleveland uses the DAS at all. Yeah, we use the DAS, but um, there's a lot of data that the DAS isn't very widely used. It's a little cumbersome. Um, you have to have a DAS calculator. Um, with all this sort of esoteric argument about which biomarker is best, what almost everybody will tell you, you know, ULAR, um, ACR, RNS, all the big meetings, is just use something. Measure them. Yeah. Measure the disease progression. Pick one, but then use it, whichever one it is. And so then no, the, it's not widely used. And the college age student, I think we rely more on the biologics because it seems like there's more of a safety net there with pregnancy as well as alcohol. Is that sort of where you steer the patients? Yes, we try to keep them on biologics also. Um, it seems to be, and lots of them are, have actually been on biologics when they're coming to us, so it just seems to be the easiest way to go. Um, you're not working, worrying about them a methotrexate and drinking, you know, at those college parties, um, so or, or not even or even taking them. So I think the biologics, and they've been used to injections at this point. The one big question you have to ask them: Have you been giving your injection, or has mom or dad been doing it for you? Um, and sometimes they do need to be trained. You know, to give those to themselves, but they seem, you know, it's over time they seem to do fine. It's just that initial introduction into it. I do know, reading some articles recently, there's a lot of research, and Canada's doing a lot of research on this and developing some social networks, which I'm not that good with. But even Twitter type things, letting them get connected. Um, so it's kind of interesting, and they're doing a lot of research on that. So it'll be interesting to see what we get out of that and. Um, you know, that for again, for me, it's easy. It's probably a little easier for Betsy too, because we are more in, you know, academic areas and, and a, a lot more support systems. I think it's far more difficult when you're getting out into the more rural areas and, and try and integrate some of this stuff. But we use the DAS. You know, it's easy for us because it's embedded in, into our medical records. So I just have to pop in the, the numbers, and it calculates for me. So it's been easy. So that's what we're doing at this point. So it's working for us. <laughs> and then have you used Rituxin for some of these college age kids because they don't have to come in as frequently to get the treatments or do you usually stick with something that they know or what have you had success with? We haven't had children on Rituxin yet in our office and that doesn't mean we won't. <laughs> but at this point we haven't seen anybody come in uh, with that. You know, certainly this is off our array, but you know, we have the kids coming in with Ben Lista and stuff who have lupus, but um, having gone down the retoxin, it just may be that that child has not transitioned over to us yet. But I'm sure we will. We're moving more and more of them over because some of these children stay in the pediatric world late into their early to mid 20s. You know, so that's an interesting. I know that's overwhelming their population, at least in our area. Okay, Betsy, anything final wrap up to add about biomarkers and European data and nurse run clinics in Europe and things like that? Do you have any words of wisdom for us? Well, they're not really words of wisdom, it's more like a wish list. Um, I know there was a question that came in that we didn't have time for about um, why Europe gets their patients on, on biologics faster. They have pretty much the same biologics we have, um, but they have universal health care. So if they come in and they're deemed to have you know, high CCP and, and high likelihood for erosions, they can be on a biologic within a week. Um, whereas, you know, you have to go through failing first lines and that kind of thing. So it's more of a wish list than a, than a <coughs> insight, but uh, we'll get there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Kevin, you want to give us some information about Rheumatology Nurses Society in our last I minute? would love to. What, one of the uh, secret missions that Iris is on, she's also our conference committee chair uh, this year for the Rheumatology Nurses Society 8th Annual Conference in August. We had a comment come in from RoomRN on Twitter um, who said, you know, love to find more case studies like this. But one of the great ways of doing it, and not to go into an infomercial here, is at the RNS Annual Conference. Um, you'll hear 18 and a half credit hours of case studies and of, of new um, treatment options and new concepts. I mean, it's just it's a phenomenal conference. I'll show you a quick idea of the lineup coming up to that conference. Um, if this will come up for me here. And I love technology. So if you can see that, it's not too late to dive deep to come and join us in Orlando. Um, to give you an idea of our lineups, we have 
Uh, of course, Dr. Calabrese. We have um, Dr. Grace Wright. Of course, Iris Zink, our president, Sherry Carter. We have a phenomenal lineup. Many of you will receive this flyer in the mail here in the next uh, couple of days. This is a new piece that we just put out. So definitely um, come and join us in Orlando. I think that's going to be a fantastic opportunity for networking. Also, if you have not received the most recent uh, copy of the Rheumatology Nurse Practice, um, you can go to our website and sign up for it, rnsnurse.org forward slash rnp. And so at on our website, if that comes up, and of course I'm seeing a delay of this, um, but on our website, if you click on free registration, you can just put in your name and your um, email address, your shipping address, and we'll get you the most recent copy um, for the rheumatology nurse practice. Many of our panelists today are actually authors um, for that, so definitely you know come and, and check that out. So any other last comments from anyone? Awesome. Join us in Orlando. That's right. Sure. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you all. And this concludes our broadcast. This broadcast will be available for replay on the rnsnurse.org website as well as our Facebook, and you'll see information on Twitter. So thank you all so much. <laughs>